Pittsburgh Steelers have officially announced Omar Khan as the new GM, along with two new additions to the front office. Does this mean a philosophy change in how they operate? We'll talk about that and a lot more, along with OTAs Day 2 and what we've been learning about the Steelers as they continue their first practices. Joining me today on the Lockdown Steelers podcast is Tony Serino of AFC North Talk. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find the show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you're watching this video on YouTube, hit the like button on the video if you enjoyed it. Hit the subscribe button to our YouTube channel to get all of our daily updates. We have daily episodes Monday through Friday, as well as breaking news updates and bonus episodes from time to time. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day. Give us a five-star rating, the positive comment on Apple Podcasts, and we'll get you a shot at the end of the show. Joining me today is Tony Serino. Man, is back in action on a Thursday. Yeah. Uh, listen, we got we, we got to work out. I, I, I was going to say, we got to work out these days, but it's really, we it's it's, it's on me. Got to work this out. But it, it, the <laughs> little little alliteration today, right? A Tony Thursday? It's, Tony it's, Thursday. It works. It works. It works. It's better. It's not better. as cool yeah, as yeah. Tony Tuesday, because it's That's like right. the, the Tuesday is better than the Thursday to go with Tony. But it's there fine. We it's fine. We're working with what we got. But the Steelers are working with what they got, and they stayed in-house with the GM pick. Now, I, I did, again, I want to fully explain to all of our listeners and viewers, if you missed, if you missed this, we recorded a full episode with, with Josh Taylor before this news broke yesterday. So I did know about it. I released a breaking news update that came out a few hours before that th- that show was, was released. So that's why we didn't talk about it during the last full episode. But it worked out because the Steelers officially announced it. It's not just a report from Adam Schefter, Edith Kinkabwaller, Ian Rappaport, and Jerry Dulac anymore. It's real. And Omar Khan is the team's new GM. And along with him is, is Andy Weidel, uh, assistant who was an ass- assistant GM or assistant personnel director for the uh, for the Philadelphia Philadelphia Eagles, and also uh, the v- vice president of player personnel Sheldon White of the Lions. Uh, they he's going to join he's going to yeah. join the office, which you know that that's two new names there, and that means that you know in all likelihood it might mean Brandon Hunt's out of the picture here. Yeah, it, it, I think this is, you know, this reminds me a little bit of when Mike Tomlin originally got hired, right? The two favorites for the job back then were offensive coordinator Ken Wisenhunt and the offensive line coach Russ Grimm, both yeah. guys kind of vying for the job. When neither of them got it, they both kind of left the organization and said, okay, well, you know, we wanted the head coaching job. We're not going to stick around. It does seem like, unfortunately, you know, Brandon Hunt's been very, very good for this organization for a long time. But, you know, I think when the Steelers selected Omar Khan, potentially they they offered him the job they ended up giving to Weidel. But I imagine he he thought at the time, look, if I'm not going to get the GM job, you know, I, I can't. I, he literally could not move up anymore here at, at the Steelers, and so you know he's probably going to take his talents elsewhere. It's, it's tough, but um, I am surprised. You know, I I I thought at the end of this process, Chris, that we, that I wouldn't be shocked by the announcement because it, you know, much like when they when they were going through how many names did they go through for defensive coordinator. Uh, before they just landed on the obvious choice of oh they're going to promote Terrell Austin from within. Oh, shocker. <laughs> this is the same and, thing. And I thought I thought this would be the exact same thing, right? You know they they how many? I mean we got like round one GM yeah. list, round two GM list. Like okay, you're gonna it's either gonna be Con or Hunt, Con or Hunt. Let's just find out who it is. So when they uh, you know they announce Hunt now, but like you said, it's not just like the, the Omar Hunt thing is interesting in its own right, but the fact that it's kind of this this trifecta or you know the, the the trinity like like the dc you know batman superman and, and wonder woman uh it, it that that more is interesting to me because I, the, my first thought was is this a too many cook situation chris i mean is this a too situation where you have to replace kevin colbert one guy with three people I and mean, maybe it's two because you're replacing brandon hunt as well but right. you know it's all of a sudden, you don't have another. You don't have a a guy at the top. You have a guy at the top who is going to delegate some of his tasks here, and some of his tasks are going to go over there. And it's interesting. It, it is interesting because Omar Khan, as everyone knows him, is a money guy. Now, this is a guy who's been around football for twenty. You know, not yep. well, more than, more than twenty one years. He's been around the Steelers organization for twenty one years. So, like, I, I don't think 
I don't think it's like he's devoid of, of scouting and football knowledge. It's just that's just not his background where he came from. He's more of he's more of the numbers guy who handles things in house for the Steelers. But it, he also might be, you know, we also might be seeing a shift in just how they operate in general with how their front office works. You know, Kevin Colbert's a guy who who also did did the scouting, you know, or or was helped organize the, the scouting. Omar Khan might be the guy that just says, yeah, like put together, like, hey, this is the these are the general goals that we have. But I'm letting mm-hmm. you guys handle the specifics but i'm telling you these are the numbers i'm working with and these are right. this is how we're going to pay these different positions as as time as time goes on and i wonder tony is part of this maybe because we're about to be in this unprecedented era of just salary cap expansion and the steelers front office does need to make smart moves to kind of handle that and be on the cutting edge of how you spend for certain positions as we redefine them that, you know, I thought about that and my original, so it's a good point because yes, we, you know, we're in this kind of weird thing where all these wide receivers are getting, you know, just absolutely insane money. Uh, the, the quarterback market is about to be, you know, was kind of reset again with yeah. that Deshaun Watson deal where it was fully guaranteed hundred percent guaranteed Jeez. a deal we really hadn't seen previously. And so, yeah, that, that was a thought that certainly entered, you know, which is, did they, did they sign the cap guy because of what's happening to the cap and they don't, you know, they, they need to, to find um interesting ways of, of kind of maneuvering it the way Omar Khan has been so brilliant in doing in years past. It does seem a little reactionary though. You know that that you would you know the, the, the idea that you're gonna you're gonna get your GM and you're gonna sign sign your GM for the right now. You know, this is right. a guy who's you know if Omar Khan works out, you know, Kevin Colbert was GM for what 20 years. Yeah. Um so this is a guy who's gonna be GM for, for 20 years now. You know, like, you know, will we still be talking about the salary cap and all the kind of changes that the the, the maneuvering that's happening five years from now will we still be talking about how crazy it is it'll just kind of be the new normal and so it was a it was a thought i had but i thought it was a little too reactionary for the steelers for my liking and i I think the steelers are um the my thought when they signed omar khan and this is kind of a you know revenge of the nerd thing right i i I like omar khan because he's a numbers guy he's a nerd i you know i'm a computer programmer by day uh (laughs) so certainly i i love the idea that the steelers are are embracing the nerds and they went out and got a guy from philly you know, Andy Weidel, who is talking about this too. Yeah. Yeah. Andy Weidel's a guy who, uh, you know, Philadelphia known for their kind of analytics and being super aggressive and, uh, you know, the, the draft maneuverings that they do every year. Um, so yeah, I, you know, my thought was the Steelers, if you listen to a lot of the analytics community, right, the bill, the bill Barnwell's, the PFS, the football outsiders, they refer to the Steelers as those old traditional football guy, you know, front offices. Mm-hmm. Is this a sh- changing of the guard in that way? Because Omar Khan is a nerd, you know, he's likely going to be, you know, more into the analytics than Kevin Colbert was. And if he's going to have final say on these things, could we see- start to see a shift with the steel organization? Not to say that they're not going to be the football guys. I and mean, Mike Tomlin's still going to be the coach, but you know, are we going to see more data brought in here? Maybe an expansion of the analytics department and, and some, some like that. Um, I-, I think that's something to watch for going forward. And I think it's very interesting what you say with Weidel because that is what the Eagles have been. That's what they've kind of you know put their hat on. Now I I, I know that there's probably some people thinking there like, well, wait a second, it's the Steelers' way has worked for so long, and people have been so proud of the Steelers' way and not bending to these analytical numbers that don't always translate into real football, but kind of you know, they look cool on a piece of paper. You know, I I get there's that that seems like a conflict there, but I, I do think there's also the sense that the Steelers while acknowledging that there's still the part of football that can't just be crunched out into a, a formula, there's also that part of it that you do need to modernize your way of thinking around football that includes some of this analysis. It maybe doesn't let it dominate your, your, your organization, but at least helps you and guides you a little bit more as you make your decisions, especially in the front office. Um, so I, I think this is an interesting shift that we could be seeing in how the Steelers front office works. Um, but I mean, only time will tell, you know, you know, I, I was joking around with Alan Saunders of my partner at Steelers now.com. Um, and he was, you know, he was posting, you know, everyone's posting their memes like Omar's coming from the wire or con from Star Trek. But I'm just like, man, we got to wait like a whole year to, 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 to do the con joke when he makes a draft pick. And someone brought a good point is like, Chris, what if he makes some, some like wild moves right now? Like, like, like what, what if this year there's, there's some signings or a trade or something and that shakes up everything. And we, and like, you're absolutely right. I am, I, from what we understand, Omar Khan was not a per, was not the personnel decision making guy, or the guy was in Kevin Colbert's ear. He was the guy that did the numbers and handled that kind of stuff. Right. So, 
what if Andy Weidel and Sheldon White, what if what if these guys, along with Khan, come in and we see this just shift in how they in, in this paradigm shift where they're more aggressive, there's more trades, there's not they're not as they're not going to sit home with with the veterans that they got that when they get the veterans, not going to hold on to them forever. Right. I'm intrigued to see what kind of philosophy shifts we we we, we get to see from this group. Omar Khan was Omar Khan a Malik Willis guy? How about how about Kenny Pickett from Malik Willis straight up right now, Omar? Let's pull the trigger. Let's go. Okay, okay, you're you're <laughs> you're doing a little much here, but we do want to talk about the quarterbacks because we've we've been we've heard from Mitch Trubisky. I talked about him on yesterday's episode, but of course Tony's got some thoughts on on Mitch Trubisky. We'll get to them because that's his boy. He's on the Mitch Trubisky train. Um, but uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But first, I got to talk to you guys about Bill Bar and not just Bill Bar. But they have new built granola bars. If you're a, if you're a granola bar fan, you got to try built granola bars, and they come in in three unbelievable flavors. They have chocolate peanut butter, chocolate coconut, and white chocolate berry. If you want to try all three flavors, you can get a mix box at built.com right now. And they're all they are so different from the built from the bars and the normal built bars and the normal built puffs. Built granola bars are loaded with granola. It's the perfect combination of crunch and chewiness. But just like bars and puffs, these babies are packed with protein and covered in 100% real chocolate. They come in with, with 150 calories, 15 grams of protein, and only 4 grams of sugar. Built granola bars will change your world. Built has cracked the code to better granola. They're, be they're the perfect healthy snack to pack in your lunch, take on the road, or eat as a snack. And they are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. So if you've been waiting for a healthy and delicious granola bar to hit the market, this is your time. Head to Built.com right now and use and get the Built Granola Bars, three delicious, delicious flavors to try. Chocolate peanut butter, chocolate coconut, white chocolate berry. Don't miss out. You got to get yours today. Go to Built.com and get Built Granola Bars now. Again, that's Built.com. And when you go to Built.com, always use the promo code LOCK15. It's L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, LOCK15. And you'll get 15% off your next order when you visit Built.com. Back here in the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm Chris Carter. He's Tony Serino. Now, I don't want to spend too long on this because I did talk about this yesterday, but uh, two Tony, segments. You're... We're doing two segments on oh, Mitch. Okay, stop. <laughs> Calm it down. So, Tony. Three segments. Fine. I agree. Continue. Your, your boy, Mitch Trubisky, is looking like the QB1 right now, mm -hmm. um, at least in the early sets of reps and OTAs. Kevin Dotson even confirmed it when we were talking to him. Um, but – uh, I, I think it's interesting to see this, this this start the way it is, but it's also like not a surprise. And I also think that this doesn't determine how things actually will end up in training camp. Like right now, it's it's uh, Mitch Trubisky, Mason Rudolph, Kenny Pickett, and Chris Olatikin. Um, mm -hmm. And I just I, I look at that and I'm like, eh, that could get a little different uh as time rolls on you might see kenny pickett jump up into the two role uh but it, it, there's a lot of senses that also mason rudolph doesn't feel like he's out of anything either he's very cheery he's around the locker room a lot of people are are having good interactions with him i had a a fun little interaction where he, i was talking to mason cole the, te the, the team's new number one center and mason rudolph was like how does it feel to be the number two mason or something like that and it was it was kind of like a nice joke where like they were kind of laughing about it but it makes it makes it like, man, like this is an interesting locker room where, you know, we think we know who QB one is, but like there's going to be real competition for it. No, 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 no. Chris, 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 <laughs> stop, stop. Listen, we know who QB one is today. I've been saying it for years, for years. Well, it's OK. Six months, almost a year, almost he, half he, a year, even. He Listen, just got Mitchell signed. Trubisky, QB how, like, how one. Is, how have you been saying for six months? He just got signed in March. It's, it's May. I've been saying it since December. Go back. We got tapes. This show is oh, recorded. Okay, Go okay. back. Okay, that's right. I didn't forget you said it in December. <laughs> All right, fine, fine. Yeah, Mitchell Trubisky, QB1 today. You know, uh, my co-host on Locked on or on on, uh, on AFC North Talk brought up a, a point yesterday. We were doing QB rankings yesterday in the AFC North. And he brought up a point, which is, what, ha what do the Steelers do? Now that they've drafted Kenny Pickett, 20th overall, what happens? And this is a very realistic scenario, by the way. What happens if Mitchell Trubisky does turn his – Turn his entire career around and is great this year, right? What if what if the Steelers, what if he's really good and the Steelers win 11 games or something? You know, so that's something like that would that most Steeler fans today would consider to be, you know, just a pipe dream. Um, it's an interesting thought. It's an interesting thought. Now, you know, you you had a very reasonable take there, and I and I will agree with you. 
Sure, it's it's OTA practice number one or two or whatever we're at, we're yeah, at yep. now. Yeah, maybe maybe we shouldn't look too deeply into the the rankings here. You know, last year's rookie did get the start right away. Najee Harris started right away at running back from basically the word go. Tomlin mm -hmm. didn't wait around. But in years past, you know, they they it's not like these guys have gotten every single snap from the word go. You know, remember we were waiting for you know is 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 Chase Claypool going to be in the in you know which which uh. Which line, which quarterback line is Deontay going to be in? Which quarterback line is Chase Claypool going to be in? Which quarterback line is James Washington going to be in? You know, for for uh, Pickett, I think once we get into July, you know, once we start getting into, let's say, week three of training camp, we start getting into preseason, you know, what game does Kenny Pickett get to play with the starters? Is it game two, right? Do, do they go Mitch Trubisky starts game one, which I think is a, a lock, but does, does Kenny start game two? Because if Kenny starts game two, then maybe – We'll have a you know we'll have a real competition where Kenny Pickett could win this thing outright. I just want to point out that Bitch Trubisky lifetime mm -hmm. is three and zero versus the other teams in the AFC North. Ooh, well, listen, it's about to be uh, it's about to be nine and zero after there this you year. Go. So there you <laughs> go. I mean, listen, <laughs> and he's never played the Steelers. So seventeen and zero, seventeen and zero. I think I was looking at the schedule. We did a schedule review show, and uh, yeah, I just I don't I don't know how this team loses a game, Chris. I'm be honest with you. I was looking down the schedule, and I was like, this is just a uh, right, cakewalk. All right. Right. We, we, we've had we've had our fun here, but I want to get to some to some real stuff today. And I, I wanted to talk about uh, Kevin Dotson. Now, I wrote a whole article like, about like my conversations with Kevin Dotson over the last two days. As I wanted to talk to him because this is the guy last year who people were hoping would ascend into being a leader for this new for the new wave of the offensive line. It didn't work out that way. He did start for nine games, but he got hurt. Wasn't great last year had a couple like flashy moments where it was like okay there's something there but it didn't work out there was the rumor that he wasn't where you know what he wasn't conditioned enough so i got to i got to talk to him um and i wrote a whole article on steelersnow.com so you can go to steelersnow.com right now and read everything that i that, that i talked to him about but the main things that i got from kevin dots was that he feels he wasn't settled in at left guard last year he played right guard for most of his career as a, as a collegiate player and he was kind of reteaching him the himself the muscle memory that it takes to play left guard which is a real thing now you know you, you're having to understand all the little parts of it he says he feels more confident now and that he was feeling more confident towards his last couple games of the season and then he got an, an ankle injury in week nine he was out he was out for a month he tried to rush his way back and when he rushed his way back when he, his first day of practice which i actually remember um he did hurt himself and then he came right back off the field that was his, that was his season um uh, but you know this is a, this is a guy in kevin donson who He's he's he was he was deemed after his rookie year like hey this could be a fourth round steal like how, how yeah. good this guy this guy looks and to to give to go along with what he says and I, I I'm I'm the first person that'll tell you I don't always believe in PFF grades but three of his highest graded games as a player were were in his last four games at the Steelers last year so I guess my question to to you Tony is I know that the traditionally you want to build an offensive line with first and second round studs and you know the kind of the way that they did for the 2010s but is this possible for for him to get back to be the guy that everyone was hoping him to be still or are we kind of putting a little false hope into the situation yeah it's, it's I, I probably lean closer to the latter and, and the reason why I say that is you know you're absolutely right you know a year ago this time Steeler fans were thinking that you like not to say you like you said you don't build around a fourth round guard but in a world where the entire offensive line changed a year ago, right? They yeah. they lost, you know, basically everyone on the offensive line, including DeCastro. Um, he was the one guy that was going to stick around who was the, the the bright light. Okay, he had he had a decent rookie campaign, really had some some highlights in there, and you feel like, okay, he could be the left guard of the future, and now you got to figure out everything else around him. And now, you know, you fast forward, okay? You fast forward to a situation where he's in a position battle against a essentially a player who is a failed center right that's like a lot you know kevin uh, kendrick green has to either win this job at at left guard or he likely doesn't have a starting spot either and it is a bit of a fall from grace you know yeah yeah you had the report last year about the coaching staff doesn't like him and you know, the training stuff or whatever that was weird um he had the injury at the end of last season that he wasn't able to work back from you know it, it's tough look I, I still hope that that kevin dotson can be at least a serviceable player. Again, you know, the Steelers don't need him to be a superstar, right? right? They got they got James Daniels. They're paying James Daniels some decent money, right? They got, you know, they're actually paying Chooks some decent money on the outside. And they got a promising left tackle as well in, in Dan Moore. So you don't need five superstars on the offensive line to be a good offensive line. What you need are five players 
who the who defenses can't key on any one of those guys and say that's the weak link. He's the guy who doesn't know his, his assignments. He's the guy who we can attack if if we need to blitz or or um you know uh, on a play to play basis. So yeah, t- to me like what 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 Kendrick Green needs to be or excuse me what what uh Kevin Dotson needs to be this year is a, as as Mike Tomlin would say an above the line kind of player. I would have said right. a year ago that I thought he could be you know a, a star. I don't know that he's going to be there anymore. But as long as he's an above the line player. It's perfectly fine for what the Steeler offensive line needs. And, and I agree with that. And if you even remember, like the, the golden age, I guess you would call it, of the, of the last Steelers offensive line, their anchors were two first-round picks. And yes. Gar- Marcus Gilbert, when he when he was part of the factor. But, you know, Ramon Foster was undrafted. Alejandro Vill- Villanueva was undrafted. Right. Um, and then, you know, Chikuma Corfor came, came along in, and they were filling in guys behind Marcus Gilbert. But you're, you're absolutely right. They don't need to draft all, you know, all first-round picks you know, for the, for the offensive line, it would be, it'd be nice, you know, to even have one in there, but you know, it's interesting because in my talking with Kevin Dotson, he talked about how James Daniels is already kind of taking the leadership role, but not in the kind of like, I'm in charge. He even kind of said like, you know, he's not saying do this, do that. He's talking to us and saying, Hey, like when I, you know, if you are, are, are do you need help with this? When I had to do that, I, this is what I learned when I was in Chicago. And yeah. what's also really unique about this offensive line, You've got two starters who you're paying not that expensive contracts to who are veterans with four years of experience, and both of them are 24 years old. Of course, James Daniels and Chikuma Korfor. That's a lot of good experience and a lot of youth to, to, to put on the line for two veterans who are older, or excuse me, younger, but still older than your than, than Kendrick Green and Kevin Dotson and Dan Moore Jr. and the other guys. Now Mason Cole kind of messes that up a little bit, you know, because he and he's projected to be the starting center right now, at least right now in in, in the OTA reps. Mm-hmm. But I, I do think it's an interesting shakeup for what the offensive line dynamics could be could be right now. Isn't isn't Kevin Dotson the oldest player on the offensive line at twenty five? Uh, Ma- Mason uh, Mason Cole is as I believe just off of his rookie. I believe uh, he, he is. Well. Oh, no, yeah. he's twenty six. He's twenty six. That's like I think he's the one that kind of sets it sets it a little bit different than everyone else. But because because he's also a veteran coming coming in. Um. But uh. But yeah, Kevin Doss is twenty five. In fact, he'll be twenty six when the season starts. Right. Um. So it is crazy how young this offensive line is, though. I mean, yeah. and like you like you talked about, you know, they the Steelers two years ago. I, I mean, there was a com- almost a completely different starting five. Only Chooks was on that team from two years ago Yeah, starting, you know, Dotson had to play some minutes, but he was a backup yeah. back then. And now today they've, they've reshifted the entire offensive line. No first round picks amongst it. Is there even a second round pick amongst the group? No. The, right? well, James Daniels is, is the only one. Yeah, it was a second round pick, but he, but he's not, you know, not, not the Steelers. Steelers. Right. Yeah. So crazy, crazy that, that, that we're in this world. And you know, do I think the Steelers have their starting five of the future today? Do I think this is it? Like this is the group they're going to build around. It seems unlikely, right? It seems yeah, unlikely that you have add more pieces here. Yeah, it seems like you're you're going to have to continue to add, you know. And left guard is one of those spots. I mean, yeah, you know what I mean. I don't think I don't think today we can sit here and say that either Kevin Dotson or Kendrick Green are guaranteed to be the Steelers' long term future at that position. You hope that they that one of them, you know, in in the classic Mike Tomlin two dog one bone situation, that one of them emerges uh, as as that guy. But um, yeah, it's it, it is it's it's so interesting how how young this offensive line got basically overnight. I mean, again, two years ago there was like old slow. It's over offensive line, and this year it's you know it's it's the it's the little, little baby offensive line yeah. out there. Young go get them offensive line. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but you know it's funny that's how the last offensive line started. Um, yeah. You know, uh, oh man, I can't remember because it, it wasn't Ramon Foster. It was Willie Cologne. I remember mm-hmm. Willie Cologne when Ramon Foster and Marquise Pouncey were in the huddle and he, and he, at one point he said, it smells like there's baby powder in here. <laughs> like, you know, because, because he was talking about all the new faces, but that was the new age of the Steelers offensive line coming. So I guess the mm-hmm. question is now is the new age of the Steelers offensive line there. We're going to quick, we're going to keep talking about this and how yeah. this is going to impact other parts of the game in just a minute here on the locked on Steelers podcast. Back here in the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm Chris Carter. He's Tony Serino, and we are talking about the Steelers and the offensive line and how it's looking a little different this year. Now, I I, I want to talk more about 
you know, also how this impacts things. You know, one thing I talked to Kevin Dotson about uh, in the locker room, and he said he felt like the offensive line, he didn't say they let him down, but he felt like Najee Harris get, doing what he did last year was amazing. And he told me that he said if they were where they were supposed to be, they would he would have been a 2,000 yard back. Yeah, I mean, like that's the kind that's high praise, you know, for his guy. And sure, it's his teammate, and he's he's supposed to talk highly of him. But there seems to be this confidence in Najee Harris, who I I talked about yesterday. Dude looks jacked. Dude looks ready to go. But is it possible for this young group to kind of gel quickly enough to at least to get him the lanes to just go to go to work? You don't you don't need to be at the level that Pouncey, the Castro, Gilbert were around 2014 when Le'Veon Bell blew up. But if you're just good enough to not let him get attacked in the backfield consistently the way he was last year. That does so much more. And I think it's going to put Najee Harris in this, in this, in the the space to be able to show he's one of those top backs. It's a, it's a mentality thing for an offensive line. Right? Ramon Foster talks about this all the time. The, the fact that he talks about the, the excitement of having Le'Veon, right? The, the excitement of blocking for someone as good yeah. as Le'Veon Bell made them want to be better at their jobs, right? It made the, it made them as an offensive line excited to go out there on a play to play basis to block for a guy who was as creative as Le'Veon was. And I think Najee Harris certainly after what he did his rookie year should be inspiring to a lot of the young guys. <clears throat> you know, we've already talked about how, you know, look, it, it is a young offensive line, but it's, it's not necessarily young. It's young in age, but not necessarily young in years in the NFL, especially if Dotson wins out at left guard. Cause you've got, if the offensive line ends up being Dan Moore at, at left tackle, uh, Dotson at left guard, Cole at center, James Daniels at right guard. And, uh, a core four at right tackle. Dan Moore is the only player, and there's a second year guy. Everyone else, everyone else is either a third or fourth year player. I mean, these are these are kind of vets in there. And so, yeah, I think each of those players, you are starting to hit their prime. They understand the game. They understand their assignments. They understand what's expected of them. I do think you could see this team kind of gel together. Not to say there's a superstar in this group, but as I said before, you don't need a superstar to be to be a great offensive line. Mm-hmm. What you need are not humongous holes. Uh, throughout there that defenses can easily exploit like you talked about guys have to you know as long as guys are, are dotting their eyes and crossing their t's on that offensive line things will be just fine and, and holes will be open for Le'Veon or excuse me like for Najee like they were not a year ago yeah and I think that's one part of it, but also the pass protection element of this and yeah yet whereas the Steelers did give up the fourth fewest amount of pressures last year the Ben Roethlisberger also had the quickest release of any yeah. quarterback last year yeah, yeah. because he was not trying to get hit but that's going to be different this year because you've got a lot of younger quarterbacks who are going to be more mobile who are going to be going to be able to launch the ball a bit further down the field than Ben was able to last year so you know, now the question is, now this is another thing we, you know, we got to talk to Kevin Dotson about. We asked him, like, you know, how, what is that like knowing you're going to have, there's, there's four different types of quarterbacks behind you that you're going to have to, you know, block for. And Kevin Dotson, when we asked him that he slipped out, he was like, well, it's really only one because it's Mr. Biscuit. <laughs> True. And, facts, and, facts, and, big facts. And, and he's and it's like, they, that's what they, that's what they told us. And we asked him, well, wait a minute, with they? And he was like, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, the team, they told me. Yeah. And so he, he kind of let on about that. But yeah. The point is with Kevin Dotson and what what we're and the offensive line. I did we were asking like this pass, pass protection does have to improve. Ben Roethlisberger did get pressured, you know, too much too much last season. Even you know, and there were times that they held up and, and they they were able to give give him competitive time. But they still have to be better for a young for younger quarterbacks. Ben Roethlisberger knows you know knows where things are going to be in the organization. These are going to be guys that are going to be the game's going to be moving a million miles an hour. They're not going to have that experience to lean back on to kind mm. of help with that situation. So you know, one thing. I talked to, to Kevin Dotson about. It. He said we got we're gonna have to talk better because he's like you know last year you know we would we would call things out but people wouldn't respond because you know it, it, when you're taught when you're talking on the field and thinking like oh I understand but when you call things out and someone does respond it confirms that the, that I understand you and that and then sometimes you know when someone calls something out and you think you understand but you don't that can that, that, that can confuse things so I, I'm really interested to see how he James Daniels who talked a lot also about his drop back and how he's improving where you know what he's trying to do in his pass protection those type of things that they're that they're working on I'm intrigued to see how this can come together in gel as a group to yeah. be a real offensive line that protects whoever is the quarterback it, it it to me it is it is the great mystery of this offensive line really over the past two seasons, which is just just how good were they at pass protection? Because like you said, Ben got rid of the ball so quickly. Yeah, you know you you talked about Kevin Dotson uh, and, and his PFF grade uh, over his last couple games and, and and how they were the best grades. Allow me to bring my own PFF grade. You'll remember yeah. that 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 game in Cleveland 
Dan Moore, PFF gave Dan Moore's pass blocking a zero. 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 That was, zero. That was so fun. <laughs> but, okay, now, look, he got left one-on-one -on -one against Miles Garrett on, on the majority of, of snaps. Miles Garrett had one sack in that game, um, and I believe it was the only sack that the Steelers gave up in that game mm -hmm. entirely, right? And, and again, this, this goes back to the idea, you know, people talk about this all the time, right? Sacks are a quarterback stat. Um, you know, Ben just didn't hold on to the ball long enough to get sacked. I mean, yeah, there were pressure, but you know, he, the, every play was designed like get rid of right. the ball. Right. So that to me, that's why it's such a mystery is I, you know, you're, I don't think you're going to have an offense this year where Mitch is going to have the quickest time to throw or Kenny or whoever it is. It's going to be Mitch, but you know, let's just entertain, I guess. Uh, let's just say, yeah, I don't think, I don't think either one of those guys is going to have the quickest time to throw now. And you're going to, they're going to look, I'm sure as we've heard, this is the offense is going to change now without Ben. It's going to move the pocket a little more and that'll open things up. But like, you know, third and 12 and it's a you know you got to go situation you know you're not going to run a draw play here how how well does this offensive line hold up in those situations are they just going to run the little the little mesh crosser thing every single time like we've seen for the last three years boy i hope not and i hope this offensive line can protect enough that you could see uh these quarterbacks like you said uh be able to drop back scan the field and and, and hit open receivers without having to worry about you know guys coming free off the edge and things like that uh, it's going to be a, a big question to see how they do this year it, when it when it comes to those parts of the game because also you know when you're when you're looking when you're looking at pass protection and how that you know we're we've talked a lot about, a lot about how everyone's excited about the playmakers the Steelers have they have a young offensive line but they also have a young whole offense really it's not just the offensive line Pat Fryermuth is in the second year Najee Harris is in the second year George Pickett and Calvin Austin are are both rookies you know Deontay Johnson who still hasn't been OTAs but again we're waiting to see how that'll play out yeah. Chase Claypool has been there um and but like those are two guys that are still in their rookie contracts and in their mid-20s this is a this is a very young group um and I I think there's a there's a bit of excitement in the air to be a young offense again and mm -hmm. to see where that take you takes you both on the line and and among the playmakers. Yeah, no, for sure. And and yeah, like you talked about, you know, you got all these playmakers, right? We could imagine a world where the Steelers can go like four wide or even five wide at times. Mm -hmm. um, but what that okay, when you when you do that though, when you run that kind of spread, you know, the offensive line has to be they, they ought to be very communicative with one another to know what the checks are, to know what the alignment is. Because you know, there's no protection for them. They got to know where to slide or who's you know where uh, where the the free defender is going to come from. The quarterback has to be in that too. I mean, they talk about Mitch Trubisky in a brand new offense for him. Can he pick it in, in you know in a rookie situation? Those are the situations where yeah, I mean, everyone kind of has to be together, and that's really to me that's on the coaching staff to get everyone aware of the you know the situational football in those moments of where everyone's got to be. Those are the moments where you'll see whether or not this thing is really starting to come together. If the Steelers can can go with kind of more spread sets at times, and not say you know they're going to be living out of those because we know they're going to run a lot more eleven uh, or twelve. Um, but let's say that they did. I mean, I think in those situations, everyone has to communicate. Those are the moments where you'll see where this offensive line, where this quarterback group is ready to go. We certainly will. We'll keep you guys apprised of everything. Omar Khan is set to talk 10 a.m. at the Steelers facility on Friday, so ooh, there will ooh, be ooh, we'll, we'll, that'll be interesting to see what we learn from him uh, with our first chance to talk with him since he's been named GM by the Pittsburgh Steelers. But they got the third day of OTAs on today, this Thursday. We'll be breaking things down here on the Friday episode of the Lockdown Steelers podcast before Omar Khan talks about that. So do stay tuned for what we do here, Tony. Thanks so much for joining us here yeah. on the show. Always appreciate having you here, man, to joke around about Mitch Trubisky. And, it's not uh, jokes. And, These are not jokes, Chris. These are not jokes. Yeah. I own merchandise. Yeah, I, I will own more. <laughs> Let people that can find you follow you and get more you work. <laughs> sure. If you want to join the Mitchell Trubisky hype train, follow me on Twitter, at Steeler Country. Uh, and you can also find me on YouTube. I do a show called AFC North Talk. It's a roundtable show all about the AFC North. We're going through our position rankings. Right now, going to be a lot of fun. Also, I want to say about Omar Khan. So Omar Khan's doing his his uh, press conference on. Well, he's, yeah, it's tomorrow. Oh, I can't wait for that. I mean, again, Revenge of the Nerds. All I need him to say, just 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 Omar, just meant just say EPA, just say EPA one time, just say Dominator rating when it comes to wide receivers or breakout age or you know, one of like the advanced analysts. Just kind of get DVOA, just a, just a wink, just a little wink to us, so we know that that you're with you're with the nerds. <laughs> you sir are wild. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for being with us, Tony. I'm Chris Carter, host of the Locked On Steelers podcast. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. You can watch and listen to the Locked On Steelers podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. Watch this video on YouTube if you liked it. 
you can hit the like button on on this video let us know that you liked it and you can subscribe to our youtube channel that gives you monday to friday episodes bonus episodes and breaking news updates when they happen here uh, on your Pittsburgh Steelers. You can also read my work at SteelersNow.com where we also break things down uh, and we're writing, all, we're covering everything there. So if you want up, you know, a lot more fast paced information, that's where you go to read all my work as well as my colleagues, Nick Faribault and Alan Saunders. We'll be back tomorrow, tomorrow finishing out the week of Locked On Steelers, giving you a final recap on how OTAs ended in the first week with Jenna Harner. We'll see you.